War happens to people, one by one. That is really all I have to say, and it seems to me I have been saying it forever. Unless they are immediate victims, the majority of mankind behave as if war was an act of God which could not be prevented, or they behave as if war elsewhere was none of their business. It would be a bitter cosmic joke if we destroy ourselves due to atrophy of the imagination. Martha Gellhorn Martha Gellhorn was born in 1908, the daughter of Edna Gellhorn, who was a suffragette and a civic leader who helped found the National League of Women Voters. It was the height of the rise of feminism, and Edna instilled in her daughter a strong sense of self-worth and civic duty. In 1916, she took Martha to her first event, the Democratic National Convention in St. Louis. There they stood among thousands of women wielding yellow parasols along both sides of the street, forming what was called the Golden Lane. Democratic delegates had to walk past them to get to the convention on opening day. Those women from states who had not enfranchised women voters wore all black. Martha stood in the front row representing future voters. In 1927, she dropped out of Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania and began writing for the New Republic in New York. By 21, she was already eager to see the world, saying later that she wanted to go everywhere and see everything and write about it. She was also unsatisfied with the sorts of stories the New Republic wanted her to do, which mostly included fluff pieces meant for women, and ignoring stories Gellhorn thought were more important. So she left for Paris, paying for her trip across the ocean by writing a brochure for the transportation company. There she worked at the United Press Bureau for two years. She thoroughly enjoyed Paris, and even had an affair with French writer Bertrand de Jovenet. But she had trouble when a male co-worker began sexually harassing her. Gellhorn reported the perpetrator, but rather than getting justice, she was fired. Returning to the United States in 1932, she worked for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. While working there, she wrote her first novel called What Mad Pursuit, a semi-autobiographical piece about a cynical female reporter. The book caught the attention of a top official in President Roosevelt's administration, Harry Hopkins. He hired Gellhorn to travel a country with the Federal Emergency Relief Administration and write about the effects of the Great Depression. Her articles had such a strong effect that they attracted the attention of Eleanor Roosevelt, who invited Gellhorn to live at the White House where she could help the First Lady with her My Day column in Women's Home Companion. Gellhorn used her experience traveling the U.S. during the Depression to write a series of short stories entitled The Trouble I've Seen, which released in 1936. That same year, Martha Gellhorn was in Key West, Florida, where she met the writer Ernest Hemingway. They became good friends, and when Gellhorn left to cover the Spanish Civil War for Collier's Weekly, Hemingway decided to go with her. It was during their time in Barcelona that their relationship seemed to become romantic, despite Hemingway's marriage to another woman. In 1938, Gellhorn went to Germany and reported on the rise of Adolf Hitler, and then continued on to Czechoslovakia. There she witnessed and reported on Germany's march to power, which she described in her novel A Stricken Field in 1940. Near the end of that same year, she and Ernest Hemingway would marry, as he had by that time divorced his second wife. Gellhorn took her newlywed husband with her to China where she would be reporting on the Chinese retreat from the Japanese army. Hemingway grew more and more frustrated. Though he had known Gellhorn's ambitions, he had thought that once they were married, she would settle down at home with some kids. He was wrong. The war had brought with it endless atrocities, crimes against humanity she felt compelled to report on. Despite being a veteran of the First World War, or perhaps because of it, Hemingway was much more stoic in regards to the suffering, and had difficulty connecting with his wife's idealism. He returned to his estate in Havana, Cuba, where he waited impatiently for his wife to come home and live a more traditional life as a housewife. When she continued to travel to various locations of the war, he wrote to her asking, Are you a war correspondent, or wife in my bed? It didn't work, and he continued to wait for her surrounded by a horde of six-toed cats he was breeding while he wrote his next novel. At the turning of the tide of the war, Gellhorn secured a place on board a plane during the D-Day invasion. Catching wind of this, Hemingway decided to cut her off. He offered his services to the same magazine, which gave him her seat on the plane. Angry at the betrayal, Gellhorn would not be stopped. She stowed away inside the bathroom of a hospital boat, and when it landed on Omaha Beach, she got ashore as a stretcher bearer. That got her into France the only female reporter to do so. 
While her husband remained in the UK reporting on when information came back to him, Martha Gellhorn pushed forward with the Allied armies. She was stopped multiple times, even arrested once, but she always talked her way out of it, claiming she was the girlfriend of a soldier, or delivering a message of some sort. Through all sorts of means, she managed to remain close to the front lines as they pushed further into France, and then into Germany. She was with a unit of American soldiers when they liberated Dachau, one of the most infamous concentration camps of Nazi Germany. Behind the barbed wire and the electric fence, the skeletons sat in the sun and searched themselves for lice, she wrote. They have no age and no faces. They all look alike and like nothing you will ever see, if you are lucky. A train had recently arrived with a car full of prisoners who had been locked inside to starve to death. Only one person had survived. A man who stood on a pile of bodies weeping as they opened the door. Everyone is dead, he said. She traveled back with freed American prisoners. She wrote of the experience, No one looked out the window as we flew over Germany. No one wanted to see Germany again. They turned away from it in sickness. Everything about it was evil. The men sat in silence for a long time until one soldier said, No one will believe us. She later wrote that the experience at Dachau broke her. A belief in humanity escaped that never returned. She was never again as happy as she had been before that day. Perhaps emboldened by this, when Gellhorn returned to her husband in London, she told Hemingway that she had had enough of him. She divorced him in 1945. When people wanted to interview her in later years, Gellhorn would only grant it if they did not bring up her marriage to Hemingway. I've been a writer for over 40 years, she said. I was a writer before I met him, and I was a writer after I left him. Why should I merely be a footnote in his life? In the aftermath of the war, Gellhorn traveled through Europe reporting on the devastation. While visiting an Italian orphanage, she decided to adopt a young boy, Sandy. She brought him back to the U.S. and tried to settle down in one place and raise him. She also remarried and had a son named George. But in 1963, the marriage broke up. Not long after that, she went off to cover international news stories again, leaving her two sons in the care of her parents. Working for the Atlantic Monthly, she landed with troops in Vietnam where she became disenchanted with America, which she felt was becoming imperialistic. She soon after moved to London where she lived the rest of her life. From there, she covered more conflicts across the globe, always writing about the effects of the population rather than the strategies and the politics. In the 1980s, she wrote a book entitled The Face of War, in which she revealed just how much money the United States was spending on nuclear weapons alone which amounted to just over one billion dollars a day. Gellhorn had no illusions about human nature. She was even pessimistic about her impact. But she believed in the importance of writing it down. If nobody puts it down on the record anywhere, then the monsters win totally, she said. It must be some place on the record because otherwise they can get away with anything. Does it stop anything? I don't feel that anything I have done is any use, but at least it is better than silence. In the 1990s, a botched cataract surgery left her almost completely blind. In 1998, losing the remainder of her sight and suffering from ovarian cancer, she decided to commit suicide by swallowing a cyanide capsule. She was 89 years old. The following year, the Martha Gellhorn Prize for Journalism was established, which is awarded to a war correspondent who tells a human story that illuminates an urgent issue and exposes establishment conduct. Gellhorn's impact on journalism cannot be overstated. Many top journalists today, especially female journalists, credit her with paving the way for them. Her focus on war's impact on civilians has inspired how news organizations cover wars. And despite the fact that she left the country, she was memorialized in a U.S. postage stamp as one of the top five most influential journalists in the nation's history. Music